This is a film about a mystery. It is a film about a historical struggle. A film that reveals the enigmatic past of a disorder that has bewildered humanity since before the days of medical science. This is also a story. A story about my life and the lives of others touched by this mysterious condition. A story about struggles and triumphs, hopes and dreams. It is my life's work and I use it to inspire others and hope that it will continue to enlighten the world and complete the mission that began when I was just a child. You see, at an early age, I was diagnosed with a chronic, relatively unknown and extremely complex neurological disorder known as Tourette syndrome. At the time, there were basically no effective treatments and not too many folks were familiar with the condition. In fact, Tourette syndrome is plagued with misdiagnoses that range from horrific to downright absurd. By the age of 10, I was reaching the peak of my symptoms. I was also already enamored with the world of showmanship. And I believe that despite my condition, I could develop the skills necessary to be a great entertainer and use my abilities to inspire the world. This is my life, my story, my Tourette's. People wear masks to conceal something about themselves that they don't want others to know. But for those with Tourette syndrome, there is no way to conceal its effects. Throughout its mysterious history, its disorder has been diagnosed as demonic possession, insanity, and neurological dysfunction. I wonder, what could cause such a varying range of diagnoses? To get to the bottom of it, let's take a look at the symptoms, generally known as tics. The two most common are vocal and movement tics, which can range from incoherent sounds to uncontrollable speech and a simple gesture like eye blinking or self-injurious movements. The severity of tics range from case to case and can vary widely. There are even aspects of Tourette syndrome which others may never see, such as intrusive thoughts. This is when a person is unable to prevent irrational or negative thoughts from penetrating their minds. When most people think of Tourette's, they picture random outbursts of profanity. Ironically though, most people don't know that this form of TS is called coprolalia, and it shows up in only about 10% of cases. So what exactly is causing this misconception? No offense, but you ever had yourself checked for Tourette's? What? Tourette's syndrome. Seriously. Hey, hey, hey. You gotta take or something. I don't know. It's like some people grind their teeth when I'm nervous, tense or something. Okay. Well, if that's what it takes to get people to learn about TS, at least they're taking it seriously. This really isn't all that fun. <laughs> Obviously, you can see how damaging this sort of publicity can be. Not this time, you little s***. We'll see about that, old man. Would somebody please come over here and s*** me up the Yes! Once again, ignorance is the root of the problem. It pains me to see the entertainment industry that I love so much use its influence to take advantage and put another mask on this devastating disorder. Tourette syndrome, perhaps more than any other condition, has historically been the tragic victim of misinformation and negative stereotyping. Doctors who encountered someone spouting profanity and twitching uncontrollably would blame supernatural causes. The prescribed treatment during this time was, believe it or not, exorcism. People who suffered from the disorder were often outcasts or labeled as possessed and kept in isolation. All of this persisted until 1884 when French neuropsychiatrist George Guy de la Tourette published his work on nine patients, describing their symptoms and coined the phrase maladie 
de tic or sickness of tics. Later, his mentor, Jean Martin Charcot, would put a name to the disorder in honor of its discoverer, hence Tourette syndrome. Thanks to his efforts, medical science began to recognize the disorder in more rational terms. Tourette was able to dispel the myths surrounding TS, and his studies led to the belief that psychological issues were the actual cause. Around the time I came into this world, perspectives on TS were once again experiencing a major shift. I was born to two loving parents. My father was a U.S. Navy serviceman in Pearl Harbor during World War II, and my mother was the homemaker. We grew up like the average American family of the time, and my father worked in the textile industry. At a very young age, my parents started to notice that I had unusual tendencies. I was displaying the classic signs of Tourette syndrome. Of course, neither of them understood what was going on, and after a series of doctor visits and misdiagnosis, we eventually found our way to Dr. Shapiro. Dr. Arthur Shapiro is the man responsible for the most recent evolution in Tourette syndrome understanding. My friend and my doctor as a child, Dr. Arthur Shapiro, who I, I, I uh, feel I owe a lot to in my life. He's, he's passed now a couple of years, but what a wonderful man. Um, they call him the grandfather of Tourette's because he had so many uh, breakthroughs in, in uh, or so many breakthroughs through himself and even his wife through books and through literature and, and, and um, research for Tourette's. He published articles concerning the research of Tourette's syndrome and made the groundbreaking discovery that TS is in fact a neurological, not psychological dysfunction. His research sent shockwaves through the medical field and its findings helped pave the way for modern treatment. To understand what exactly is going on, let's take a closer look at the source of the issue. There are four basic parts of the brain, known as lobes. The temporal lobe is in charge of language. The occipital lobe controls vision. The parietal lobe deals with movement, and the frontal lobe, containing many other parts of the brain, generally deals with planning. Then there is the basal ganglia, which is primarily involved in action, selection, and decision-making. Dr. Shapiro discovered that in those with Tourette's, there seems to be a dysfunction in communication between the basal ganglia and the frontal lobe. This is why people affected by TS are unable to plan or control certain actions, which we call tics. When Dr. Shapiro was finally able to explain what was happening to me, it took a huge weight off our shoulders. I, I consider myself very blessed to be able to have be diagnosed early and so to say, okay, this is what you have and now we, we try to, to, to help the problem. My tics ranged throughout childhood from eye blinking and arm twitching to vocal tics, grunts, and random words. Tics would last for different spans of time and could change at any moment. My sister Leslie recalls the experience vividly. Um. They tend to come and go. You might have a tick for three weeks and it'll disappear only to be replaced by another one that stays for three months. You would have one that lasted a year. Of course, it was always the annoying ones. Um, and one that lasted for, you know, three days. Uh, I also noticed that you would mimic certain things. So if somebody said something, it struck you, you would mimic that person for days. I mean... <sighs> You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, you had the barking tick, right. which has never uh, really gone away. It's no, changed it's... its tune, but it's never really gone away. So you would, you would bark, um, which was, it, I had the bedroom next to Danny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Yes. <coughs> no, I, I learned how to fall asleep while you were barking. My father died of cancer when I was 12, leaving my mother behind to take care of me and my sisters. Hey, Dad was a good man, and so he, he, he passed um, two days after Christmas on the 27th of December. Uh, and it, it was kind of a shock. I mean, we knew he was sick. He was in the hospital. Um, and and we, my sisters, my mom and I, we, 
we're going to bring the gifts to him for his for him to go see him in the hospital and he said no because he was supposed to come home that friday and he said i want to have i want to sit down with my kids in front of the fire fireplace and the, and the tree and open my gifts even though it was a little after christmas and unfortunately that never happened because he passed away daddy's passing was not easy mommy had been through a lot and here she was 51 years old and a widow that's pretty young to be a widow. So she had a 12-year-old, 15-year-old, 18-year-old. I mean, that's a lot to handle on your own, especially since your youngest has Tourette's. At the time, there were few treatments that had any lasting effects on my symptoms, and medications were considered experimental at best. I underwent several studies, clinical trials, and took a variety of medications which had more side effects than it did symptom relief. Uh, you went through some horrible oh, side effects. I know I did. You know, they would give you one and she would say, nope, take him off. He's getting huge. Yep, yep. And then you'd go through another one. He's sleeping all day. He's like a zombie. And then they'd give you another one. You're like, well, he is wired to the point where he can't sleep. And it went on and on for years. The majority of them did the complete opposite and didn't really help the ticks, did not subside the ticks as, as well as expected. Uh, I gained weight, I got depressed, um, if anything it agitated, it agitated my tics um, more than helped them. And it was my mom who at one point made the suggestion of taking me off of everything. She said, what's the worst that can happen? Mommy made the decision, a uh, life-changing decision, mm -hmm. to take you off all the experimental medications. And right around that time, they, they weaned you off of everything, your tics got so much better. I like to call it my personal hell. I think everybody goes through their own. And uh, I went through it, and I'm glad I went through it when I did, because it strengthens me in, in physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally to be able to pre prepare me for, for life. Going to school was very difficult, and I endured my share of teasing. But mostly, I was treated with a sort of neglectful curiosity. I think it's important for um, children with Tourette's, depending on what school they go to um, and how many kids are in the class, that they have a really good, strong relationship with the teacher um, or multiple teachers. In 1983, my mother enrolled me in a private special needs school known as the Calais School, not too far from where we lived in New Jersey. I developed a great friendship with one of my teachers while there. His name is Joe Orlando. Now you always, um, you know, had a smile on your face. You were uh, really, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, socially involved. I think with 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 the student body. Uh, you had, I think, you made friends at pretty much every level. I was happily surprised to. To hear from you, you you were certainly memorable, you know. And when you emailed me and said, uh, "Hey, Mr. Rowe, uh, this is Danny. Do you remember me?" And I think I emailed back to you, and they said, "How can I forget you?" <laughs> <laughs> if you have a, a child who's coming into a class for the first time for the school year, and they have Tourette's, amongst other again other other uh, parts of the spectrum, that the teacher be well. Um, educated and and make sure and made sure that that they the, that the teacher understands as well as the parent understands well I think to, to be a good teacher you have to be a good learner yeah and so if you're learning something every day if you're doing something you're trying to change what you do so that you don't uh, you know you don't do the same thing in the same way every day right you know there, there's a one, one of the things I uh, I did on my dissertation was talking about outcomes-based education, and one of the the guys who was even vilified in places they they thought he was a heretic. Uh, they were going to run him out of town. Was um, a man by the name of uh, of, of um, uh, William Spady, mm. and uh, he was the guy who coined the phrase um, "every student can learn, but not in the same way on the same day." I don't know the statistics on. How much of how much of, of research that that teacher wants to do versus should do? Um, I think it's I think it should be mandatory. If if a child 
is, is has Tourette's, whether it be mild or otherwise, to be able to, to um, have control of the situation, control of the classroom, but not control of the child to, a, to an obsessive part. Just make sure the child's comfortable. Your own expectations as a, as a teacher, yeah. uh, you know, have to be realistic too. You gotta say, well, you know, he's, the student's having trouble, so you know what? And I used to do that. I would say, look, right. um, you know, we're gonna do a term paper. Yeah. And I would tell certain students, you know, I'm gonna work with you later afterwards, but I'm, I'm gonna, you know, we're gonna work together on this, but, you know, uh, just, you know, don't worry about it, because I'm gonna be telling some of the other kids in the class, you know, what they're gonna be doing. You know, reassure but, them. But we'll work on it together, so don't worry about it. If I say something, don't get, don't get upset about right. it. And so that reduced the stress, the, the stress on it, okay? Cut down on, on uh, you know, the student getting upset, okay? And maybe acting out or something like that, because I said, don't worry about it, we're gonna take care of it. Additional to many things in life with Tourette's, um, I think probably one of the, the most important things is, whether you, for Tourette's or not, is having at least one really good friend in life. And I think that goes for everybody. For me, one such friendship was with my buddy Rob. And that's another great thing about Dan. No matter the relationships I've been in, the times I've been through, he's always been a reliable friend. And like I said before, he doesn't judge. And, yeah. you, you know, it's actually been, you know, there's a human side. I think that's important is the human side of Tourette's, right. you know. We were talking one day, and this is the... This was, um, and this is something that I'm still embarrassed about to this day, but when you were talking, you were, you know, now the twitches change. Right, of course. Right, yeah. 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 And, and you were kind of twitching. And I made like this look at you, like mm -hmm. this little smile. But I didn't know what it was. Okay, right. And so I still feel bad about oh that. Oh my but, God, don't. But we kind of, we kind of moved. <laughs> don't. Don't, no, grow please. Up, yeah. Grow up. Grow so, up. <laughs> so again, I think people with Tourette's and, and other parts of the spectrum, it's harder to make friends sometimes um, because they we feel vulnerable and you think everyone's making fun of you and laughing at you so it's hard it's not easy sometimes to make a friend and and or to keep a friend and yeah. that was the first time you mentioned your Tourette's talk. okay we were talking to your mother at the house yeah and you said oh yeah I have Tourette's and that's the first time I can remember consciously hearing that term. oh wow it was through our friendship that I built up the momentum to pursue my passion in the entertainment business also, we share, of course, the love of movies and, and, and you you pursuing directing. It, it was just great. And, you know, it was funny because when we were getting ready to shoot the film, I mentioned Dan to uh, who the people I was making it with. And, uh, like, well, he didn't do a reading. He didn't audition. I go, oh, okay. And just kind of, all right, you know, whatever. Well, yeah. and, and then we just, you know, just eased him in. Yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. oh, we need somebody. Hey, oh, oh, Dan's yeah, here. Right, yeah, yeah, I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, you know, no one ever said he, did, he couldn't be in it. But, you know, it just, I, I knew that if I'm gonna make a film, right. Danny's gonna be in right. <laughs> There's just no way. Right. Yeah. So I started pursuing uh, film and television acting shortly after high school. I graduated in 1989, and um, I've, always, I've always wanted to perform. I like to perform and, and make people laugh uh, and, 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 and entertain. I, it's just in my blood to entertain people. I began to teach myself the art of special effects makeup and I practiced every opportunity I had on my character development. I studied the greats such as Charlie Chaplin and Groucho Marx. I practiced makeup artistry on myself, working on favorites and developing some original concepts, including hand makeup. Pretty much being my own agent, sending out headshots and resumes like everybody else and, and kind of just uh, not waiting by the phone, but just putting it out there and seeing what happens. and and, and the very first thing I ever got called for was a Pizza Hut commercial. And we filmed it in Connecticut and it was wonderful. And then I got, so I got a couple other calls for another couple other, a couple other uh, commercials for uh, other product. And um, then, I, then I got called, my first extra part in a movie was The Basketball Diaries. I even got a chance to meet and share screen time with the great Leonardo DiCaprio and Mark Wahlberg. There I am. When I moved up to Pennsylvania in my early 20s, I came across Frazetta's costume shop. Bill is the son of Frank Frazetta, the famous artist of the original Conan the Barbarian comics, and now one of my good friends. I remember you coming in my store. Yes. 
And was it pretty much, I think you were looking for work, right? I was looking, we had just moved up here. All right. Mom and I from New Jersey. Yeah. And I was looking, driving around looking for somewhere to, for employment. And I saw your store and I said, I've got to work here. <laughs> I knew at that time putting anybody in front of my store would draw a lot of attention. Right. Once I saw you come in as Charlie Chaplin, <laughs> and I've and I've been to Universal Studios and I've seen their Charlie Chaplins, and nobody does it better than you. Oh, my dad, you. when yeah. when he was alive, and and uh, and he liked you so much because yeah. you made him laugh. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I remember being up here on the third floor yeah. in the horror bar, and was you know, and I remember telling you to do some impersonations for him. Oh, right, okay. And you had him laughing. Yeah. And uh, and, the, and the cool thing was he loved doing impersonations. Oh, sure, yeah. You know, because yeah, he, was, he was able to do uh, Robert Mitchum really that's good. That's right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, he was funny because as kids growing up, he used yeah. to scare us in the house running from him as Robert Mitchum. <laughs> but I think that's why he also appreciated seeing you, yeah. you know, doing the impersonations. And it was funny because I used to look at you and say, all right, Danny, come on, do Jack Nicholson. Right. All right, go ahead, do Jack Nicholson. Hi, Lloyd. How are you tonight? Good evening, Mrs. Hollins. It's, uh, it's a little slow tonight. Lloyd, I want you to do me a favor. I'd like to have you bring me a glass with some ice, a bottle of bourbon. Do you think you can do that, Lloyd? Yes, I can do that. I like you, Lloyd. Best gosh damn bartender from here to Portland, Oregon, or Portland, Maine for that matter. I just happen to have two tens and two twenties. Uh, <clears throat> apparently temporarily light. How's my credit in this joint? That yeah. Rain Man. Come on. Uh oh, it's about 12. Five minutes to Watner. Of course, I'm a very good driver. Sally Tips Tips Sally. Yeah, of course, very good driver. Yeah. Memorize the phone book, A to G. Yeah, def definitely A to G. Memorize the phone book, right? Yeah, just A to G. He has 250 toothpicks in the box. Of course, 250 toothpicks. Of course, Bill Frazetta is a very good friend of mine. <laughs> very, very good friend. Frank Frazetta, good artist. Very, very good artist. Very good. He's he's passed now, but very good artist. Yeah, 22 Oak Street, Kmart. Yeah. That's it. And you always get people laughing, you know? And just watching you, how you enjoy dressing up, you know? And knowing that, you know, I have the products, you know, yeah. to offer to you. Oh, yeah, sure. And you coming yes. in, you know, it's always been a, a nice thing. Seeing, nice you know, things. seeing somebody like yourself that enjoys that so much because I love it so much. But we, you that's, know. we clicked so well from the beginning, I think, for that reason. Absolutely. Because I, I love the business. You love, you know, it was just, it was definitely a, a mutual thing. Yep. And yep. then when I did work for you. And you'd, we'd start getting things in for Halloween. I'd always take something out and try it on and go, oh, my God, how's, yeah, how's this yeah. look? Yeah, the hats oh my or whatever. Oh, God, yeah. And yeah. You always came up with something good. Yeah. Always, yeah. you know. <laughs> While working at Frazetta's costume shop, I practiced my skills at doing a jazz and blues dance routine. I even got the opportunity to work with a friend, and we toured around doing events and celebrations. I can hardly believe it. Here I was living a life I once thought impossible pursuing my dream to be a great entertainer. But one thing was missing. I haven't forgotten what it was like growing up with an obscure disorder that could have made my life turn out completely different. Although I was busy living a life I had always dreamed of, I knew the time would come when I would need to use my abilities to help others in my situation. That time came when I received a phone call from someone in my past. Brooke is a longtime friend of my sister's, and she knew me when I was going through the worst of my Tourette's. I was the only one she had ever met with the disorder until her own son was diagnosed with Tourette's many years later. Yeah, you were in school with us, and um, I was friends with your sister, right. so um, we, we were all told before you came to school 
um, about your Tourette's. Mm-hmm. We were educated about it before you started. It first crossed my mind when um, we tried putting our kids at a Christian school. Okay. And then, um, oh. you know, I, I was in the principal's office crying because parents were complaining that their kids oh. shouldn't have to be in with my kids. Oh. Oh. And I said to the principal, what do you think this is? What do you think's going on? Right. Despite the fact that we had a neuropsychological evaluation done. Yeah. And she looked at me and she said, uh, you know, have your kids had any friends in public school prior to this who had been involved with Satan? And I said, I cannot believe that, well, you know, you the times that we're in, this is still happening. And I remember, you know, um, nobody ever talked about you or made fun of you at all. We didn't make an issue of it. Oh, wow. I remember during mass hearing, you know, some cussing in the back, like outbursts. And um, I remember the teacher, you know, giving us the look, like, do not turn around. And so we didn't, none of us did. We didn't want to. We didn't even look at our teacher because we were already taught not to do that. And I thought of how you were treated and how I expected my kids to be treated the same as you were so well. Right, you know? right, right, I was fortunate, sure. Yeah. Brooke confided in me to help her understand her new situation, so I told her about my experiences as a child. As an adult, my Tourette's improved from its worst symptoms, and I have been blessed to be able to control it without medication. Many years had gone by since I was diagnosed, and I had been somewhat out of the loop. When I told Brooke my goal to make an impact, she invited me down to Atlanta, Georgia, to attend a new conference on Tourette syndrome to help me get up to speed. I knew this was the start of my mission. I was going on a tour of Tourette's. The conference that I was going to was to be hosted by none other than Brad Cohen. Brad has become an important figure in the world of Tourette syndrome. He wrote a book titled Front of the Class, which details his experiences and gained him notoriety. Brad runs the Brad Cohen Tourette Syndrome Foundation, which helps raise money for kids with a disorder. I got a chance to meet with Brad at the conference. I wrote a book, Front of the Class, how Tourette Syndrome made me the teacher I never had. And after the book, Oprah called me. Right, okay. So I'm on her show. Okay. And then after that, I'm contacted by Hallmark Hall of Fame. They want to do a made-for-TV movie about my life. Wow. That's 12 cool. million people yeah. saw the movie, and people just, you know, connected with it. Yeah. Well, yeah. well afterwards, I realized I, I want to keep, keep it going. Keep it going. Keep that momentum. So I decided to use my name as leverage to try to help raise money and support for kids with Tourette syndrome wow. around the nation. Sure. Attending the conference was a doctor by the name of James Lechman who has been leading the way for research since the days of Dr. Arthur Shapiro. And the reality is that we need to find better treatments. The other reality is, and I think Brad embodies it, is that we need to find a way to educate everybody to be aware of what this disorder is and for acceptance to be part of the standard within our society, within our minds, within our hearts. I got a chance to speak with Dr. Lechman about what's going on today. It's wonderful to speak with you and to remember Arthur and uh, Elaine. I think that we have a very different perspective because there is more education out there now. So there are more families that are aware. And the level of understanding that was present in the family, the level of understanding that was present in the school, the level of understanding that was present in the individual themselves was minuscule. In school, I'm trying to learn like everyone else. I'm sitting there in fourth grade minding my own business, but the teacher is trying to mind her own business too. And you know those fourth graders, you have to sit in your seat, face the front door, listen to your teacher, keep your mouth shut. I mean, they really didn't get it. And uh, the kind of blaming and harsh punishment and uh, all the things that can happen, even in your family, where they sort of hold you responsible. And the problem is, is there's just not enough uh, awareness and education But all of the advocacy organizations, the Tourette Syndrome Association, now the uh, Brad Cohen Association, I think that's really moving that forward. A lot certainly has changed since I was growing up. I was looking forward to hearing more, and I knew this would be a good place to start. The conference was full of information and news, 
but there was one thing that was said that really struck a chord in me. That's the story with regard to outcome, at least from the studies that we've done. And here are some of the take-home messages in terms of when the ticks are usually at their worst, uh, usually they improve. But the bottom line down there is the one you need to remember. Social and emotional and academic outcomes in adulthood are not synonymous with tick outcomes. Just because your ticks are better doesn't mean that you're on the road to success. I was principal for, for 12 years. And during that time, uh, I mean, I could see, you know, saw hundreds and hundreds of kids coming through, this, through the system. And, uh, you know, everything is not a success, okay? Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, you don't have the, the, the successes that you'd like to have. As it turns out, Tourette syndrome is in fact part of a spectrum of other disorders, including ADHD, OCD, and even autism. And what's so fascinating is that even within the population-based studies that have been done in places like Denmark and Sweden, what have they found? If you've got a full Tourette syndrome, the likelihood of your having only that condition is something around 15%. In my practice, right. uh, the most common ones to see are conditions having to do with oh. attentional difficulties, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. Okay. And that has this label, ADHD, okay. um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Right. I'm not particularly happy with the name, uh, but that's the label that's sure. been assigned to it. Sure. The other one that comes on a little later, but not again for everybody, is a form of obsessive compulsive disorder. OCD, okay. And we call that OCD. I became aware that in the Tourette's population, there are a lot of kids being diagnosed on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. Um, so there is a place, it seems, where Tourette's and autism meet. Okay. He is on the spectrum. He, he just made the cut. Our county had tested him right. uh, after oh. we got an advocate. Okay. Uh, and she suggested it. I wasn't even thinking about mm -hmm. it. For me, tics were the dominant symptoms of the disorder. Another man attending this conference, Darren Bush, has a different experience. So my tics are minor. The ADHD has been the big thing to work on. And the OCD is, currently I think the OCD is the, the thing I'm most concerned about okay. right now. There are certain varieties of OCD that are more commonly seen in individuals with Tourette syndrome. Well, it turns out that the most common one, and again, let's see if it makes sense to you with regard to what we see in the kids with tics, is ordering, arranging, symmetry, exactness. Things needing to look, feel, sound just right. Does that ring, ring any bells? Seeing that Darren had his own unique combination of symptoms, I was eager to learn about what some other people might be experiencing. Luckily, I would get my chance. This is Sean. In addition to Tourette syndrome, he added a different element to the mix. Um, I was diagnosed as hard of hearing when I was about 10 years old. About 20 to 21, I had intense ringing in my ears. And I thought it was, you know, I figured it was just tinnitus. You know, it, it would come and go. The first time I ever experienced a tick was when I was 13. But I didn't know it was a tick. All it was was, this happened in class. My teacher said, Sean, stop. And I stopped. And I didn't have a tick again until I was 15. Yes. And when I had that, it was while I was watching L.A. Law. And they had an episode where, yeah, and they had the episode where the where a man was suing to have his job reinstated because he was fired because he asked Tourette's. And when I saw him tick, I started ticking. I just, like if I can speak for everybody who's got Tourette's in different levels, there's different levels of stress, some obviously more agitated. It's very easy to agitate somebody with Tourette's um, even if it's unintentionally, in, in it's a, a stressful situation. Um, uh, you could be overly tired, you could be, uh, you know, just all the different emotions, and, and, and it will, it will, the ticks will come out more, more than, than normal. My teacher was like, Sean, what's wrong, what's wrong? I'm saying, I don't know. And I had a, a pistol in my hand, <laughs> flew out of my hand. She was trying to get me to calm down, and I couldn't calm down. I was still screaming. I was still Nervous having the tics. Oh, yeah. hmm? Nervous and jerky. Oh, yes. Yeah. Very. 
Very. Another member of the group talked about how his tics developed into depression. Throughout high school, I basically, I was going through like all these different types of drugs. Um, and they were just kind of put me on it. I can't remember the names of any of them because they were so crazy. Um, I think I was on Prozac for, I don't know how long at one point, um, just to try to figure things out. And, and then I just eventually got depressed and they put me on Zoloft and that got me suicidal. I can't speak for others, but I consider myself blessed in the scheme of things where I don't have, um, I don't have any emotional damage uh, or, or traumatizing um, things. I, I, I remember clearly what I've done with, 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 with ticks that have, I, I've hurt myself uh, and, and I can see it leaving emotional scars for a lot of people, but I've been blessed with not having those emotional scars, and that's, that's huge, and it's, again, it's a blessing. And of course, the anxiety and the depression that can come along with this are substantial and can really make a difference in terms of how person, a person is feeling. So if we're gonna educate people, we need to educate them not only about the tics, because they're right out there, but people need to know about these other things too, if you ask me. I feel very fortunate to have been diagnosed with Tourette's early on, between five and six years of age. Um, I've met many people or have read articles as of lately. So many men and women who have not been diagnosed so early on. Um, some is as young as 12, some as old as 60. And I, I can't even imagine going through probably half or, or more than half of your life not knowing exactly what's wrong with you. An author by the name of Kendall Smith, also part of the support group, recounts his experiences. As a child, I thought I had been possessed with some type of demon, and um, I would hear preacher, you know, preaching about things, you know, people's demons possessed in the Bible, and I began to think, that's what happened to me. But I can't tell anybody. I don't want people to know that this is what happened to me. But one of the realities is that very often, um, you know, well, yes, we, we, we saw these ticks when he was about four, and then we took him to the pediatrician, but they weren't there anymore. Um, and then we had to come back, and then the pediatrician saw him, and he sent him off to the ophthalmologist. I mean, it really says something about how little the doctors really know about Tourette syndrome. I was over at a friend's house, and I was, I was reading a magazine. And uh, I read an article about someone with Tourette. I remember I jumped up and said, this is it. Because I've been looking for the answer my whole life, you know, what was wrong. Doctors couldn't tell me. Psychiatrists couldn't tell me. And, and she said, what's what? And I said, this is what's wrong with me, you know. And I, I couldn't explain it to her. So many people in different walks of life, men, women, who are not being diagnosed until later in life. And I just, it almost seems unacceptable. Kendall told me about the annual National Tourette Syndrome Association Conference being held in Arlington, Virginia. We agreed to meet up there and check it out. I was diagnosed in the early days of modern Tourette Syndrome, but having met Kendall, I was intrigued to learn more about what it was like for him in a world before the enlightenment of Dr. Shapiro. When I was a child, I used to go out in the woods and I would pray, you know, God take this away from me, you know. And it's like, it never did go away. So, and I would hear, well, if you believe something strong enough, you have enough faith, it would go away. Would it? I thought, well, I ain't got enough faith. You know, it ain't going away. So, so I gave up on that. So I changed. I said, all right, if you're not going to take it away from me, let me know what's wrong with me. If I'm crazy, I want to know. The conference was a meeting ground for Tourettes from all walks of life. There's a, a gentleman I met named Andrew. Um, and I think he was the most severe case where his Tourette's got worse as he got older. I am one of the most severe cases known to the Tourette world. Really? And that's why I underwent deep, deep, deep brain stimulation because uh, the medications didn't work for me because the side effects were too severe. They put um, probes into my brain deep into the, what they call the thalamus yeah. and put the probes in here and then 
the wires go down my neck okay. um, and then connecting them up to two batteries or pacemakers here and then there was three separate surgeries. The first surgery was the right side, the second surgery was the left side a month later and then the last surgery was to put the two batteries here and connect them up to the wires and then about two weeks later to a month later they programmed me. Kendall's good friend and roommate at the conference, Jay, is a Vietnam vet with Tourette syndrome. He shared with me one of his experiences there. Now, some of the jungles in Nam, I mean, they were heavy duty. And we encountered a large contingent of the NVA, the North Vietnamese Army, which was a highly trained. And because we were so outnumbered, we could not, um, we, uh, we, had, we couldn't engage them, we had to hide. Well, I started to tick. And the guy next to me put a 16 to my head and said, if you don't shut up, I will shoot you. And I stopped. I stopped. Uh, yeah, it was It's a, just a little bit stressful. It took quite a while before anybody wanted to go back out into the field with me after that. I also ran into a member of the Simpsons animation team who has Tourette syndrome. I was diagnosed with Tourette syndrome when I was eight. Okay. So, you know, before that I had tics and we didn't really know what they were and, and, and I loved to draw before that. And my parents noticed that when I had pencils and paper in front of me, it was the only time that I wasn't just running around like, an, like a maniac, you know, like yeah. those little lightning bolts. Something about people with Tourette's, uh, myself included, who when, when focused and, and doing something, whether I'm painting, or I'm um, performing or even talking in, in a, a, a good deep conversation. I'm focused, part of the brain that's focused that otherwise is not normally focused, and it almost goes away. So let me ask you, has there ever, ever been uh, a, a, an episode of The Simpsons relating to Tourette's? Only one I know of is a, one of my favorite episodes actually where they prescribed Bart with ADD. So it's not Tourette specifically. <laughs> he would have ADD. Yeah. Right, you know, and it's either ADD or ADHD, but it's one of the attention deficit disorders. Uh, and they say, we'd like to try him on this new pill that's like in the final stages of approval. So it's like, he's basically a guinea pig and it's called Focusin. <laughs> and they basically just, you know, like have him on this pill and he becomes like a model student and very like, you know, Perfect. clean cut, exactly. He becomes almost like the ideal child. He takes the dishes from the table, puts them in the sink. Wow. All right, so what's going on, Lewis? <laughs> Not much, brother, I make it up. All right, very good. So uh, tell us uh, about your story and, and why you're here at the uh, Tourette's Conference, please. Well, uh, I'm at the Tourette's Conference because I have Tourette's. Okay. <laughs> That's <laughs> first and foremost. <laughs> I didn't just wander in to get a taste of what Tourette's is like. I was diagnosed with <laughs> Tourette's when I was seven years old and uh, I found in my life and career, uh, I'm a stand-up comic and I'm an actor, <laughs> that uh, comedy was the most healing, <laughs> therapeutic uh, way to deal with Tourette's for me. I'm, I'm, my stand-up's about my life with Tourette's, so my <laughs> tics come out more because I'm talking about it. It's like if you think about scratching your nose mm -hmm. constantly, then you're gonna get the urge uh, to do it. Right. <laughs> but yeah, stand-up has just been a blessing because that's been a great way to <laughs> not only deal with my Tourette's, but also it's a way to let loose and also spread awareness of it. My mom always said they got more out of a uh, out of the box a gift came in than the than the gift itself. And I, at 43, I'm still creating things out of out of household items, uh, spending you know sparing um, spending very little money, just going around and getting things at dollar stores and making the hats and, and other art forms helps me relax and helps me focus with my Tourette's. Um, I enjoy uh, um, you know again just creating as I go along. Again, it's steampunk. It's just very strange and interesting and unique with a lot of uh, different types of paper on it. It's an old cigar box. I always have this piece here, which I simply made out of um, a um, cracker box, an old cracker box, and took the face off it, painted it, got an old photo, and it really doesn't take a lot. It's just, you know, imagination and... and and a couple of uh, you know little little bit of spray paint. Um, this is uh, I'm, I'm trying to get this to work. It is a plug-in light bulb. It's an old uh, Edison light, light type light bulb that they sell at Home Depot. 
our electronics store. Um, trying to get it uh, to work without having to have it plugged in, of course. But again, it's something I'm working on right now for part of this hat. But I just, I, I, I like to wear many hats and, and make many hats. <laughs> in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, there is a local art gallery named Living Room, which holds a monthly art show that is open to the public. On occasion, I submit my artwork for display and attend the party. My artwork I uh, submitted for the uh, art show tonight. The three pieces sold together. I got the stretch canvas pieces with Mod Podge and some decorative paper, a CD, cassette, an A track, an old record, and I call it Throwback. So um, hopefully somebody will buy them. So it's a great show, a lot of good art here, and uh, we're going to have a nice time. So. So in a little bit, we're gonna have a, they're gonna have a dance off here um, at the art show. I think there's two people at one time, about 30 second spots to see who um, who can dance the best, and I'm going to be participating in that. I will really get in there and cut a rug, and we'll see what happens. When they felt those cold winds blow, didn't have no place to go. I said I'm tired of waiting. always have had a great time at the living room. My buddy Rich is the president and CEO who runs the gallery and the Sherman Theater next door. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We started in 2005 here in, in this project and uh, you know we've uh, nine years in we continue to grow and um, support local artists and national artists and everything in between. Rich does a wonderful job of promoting the arts in the community through his organization. As part of my tour, I decided to see what organizations exist to help with Tourette Syndrome. Of course, there's the Tourette Syndrome Association, which hosted the conference in Virginia. But in my research, I also came across an organization from my home state, the Pennsylvania Tourette Syndrome Alliance, also known as PATSA. I couldn't help but think, why are there two organizations for the same cause? Wouldn't it be better if they were just united? PATSA is based out of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So I decided to reach out and set up a meeting with them at the Gettysburg Library to get some answers. Originally, Mary Lou began it as an organization in her, in her basement um, and eventually decided to sign on as a chapter to the national organization, the Tourette Syndrome Association. Um, and then, as you mentioned, about five years ago, um, it was decided to kind of separate from the Tourette Syndrome Association. Um, at that point, we, we kind of found that our missions were a little bit separate. One of the things that we really focus on is advocating. That is a large part of our mission, um, which was a little bit separate from nationals. Um, the TSA has a great focus on research. Um, that is a piece that we don't cover. Uh, and so at that point is when we decided we are, we're going to be the Pennsylvania Tourette Syndrome Alliance. Um, and so we are a standalone organization um, supporting those throughout the state of PA. And I wondered what kinds of advocacy programs were available through PATSA. We do have our consultant service or our advocacy where our um, 
individuals will receive support um, for their children, whether it's through a school meeting um, or even having trouble perhaps in the workplace. They're able to call in and receive um, uh, some phone support and even personal support. One of the ways that we help the school teams is we'll come in and we'll do a meeting with the school. Now, not every student needs an individual education plan. Some people call it an IEP. Okay. Some kids, they just, you know, the, the team of teachers just need to understand maybe what that child's current ticks are, what kinds of things maybe to expect, and then you can look down the road and see if they're having any issues with, with the um, learning or, or any, you know, situations in the classroom or whatever. IEP 504 plan, all of this was new to me. When I was in school back in the 70s and 80s, we had never heard of such a thing. Basically, an IEP or individual education plan provides special education to the child and a 504 plan provides access to the necessary equipment for that child. An IEP is a legally binding contract between parents, the school, mental health counselors, and doctors. Any member of the contracted parties can take legal action if they feel any part of the contract has been violated by another party. To be eligible for an IEP, a student must have one or more of the 13 specific disabilities listed in the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Of course, when I took a look at the list of eligible disabilities, the closest I saw to Tourette's was speech or language impairment. Although ADHD, a comorbid of Tourette syndrome, was listed. Because when a school hears Tourette syndrome, they don't always think it could be handwriting, it could be ADHD, it could be all these other things, it could be learning disabilities. They don't think of these things and they don't always see them because a lot of our kids are very, very smart. They can kind of hide some yeah. of these things, okay? Uh, sure. um, or it can appear that they just don't care about school. Well, they're not, you know, they don't bring their homework in because they don't care about school. Well, that's not true either. They're just maybe just misplacing it. Education is education, whether it's special or not. What makes special education special? Okay. What makes special education special, more special than regular education? Okay. It's, in my opinion, okay, it's the individual in the classroom, okay, the individual teacher, counselor, specialist, principal, administrators, working together to say, we're, we're gonna do a good job. That individual education plan is through, it's a federal program. And so anybody in any state, if their child has special needs of any kind, um, it may be worth their time to go through that evaluation process to see if they qualify for that kind of support. All of this information had me thinking about my time at the Calais School. So I decided to go there and revisit some of those experiences. I went to uh, St. Philip's uh, grade school, which is uh, from second, third, and fourth grade. My Tourette's were really bad then. And then I was homeschooled for about a year and then came here to Calais when I was about 12 or 13. Um, and again, stayed here, remained here until I was 18 and graduated in 1989. Um, so again, it was, it was not a new school, but still new and up and coming for people like myself who were slower in math and had, had a, a disability or a disorder, as I like to call it, and was comfortable around other people who weren't going to judge or, or look at you funny or make fun of you. Developing responsible, caring adults with a future. Imagine that. Being at the Calais School brought back a ton of memories for me. Um, this was the wood and metal shop. And um, the room next door to this, which is also not shop, was where I met Mr. Orlando, uh, where I had him for uh, at least the first two or three years as shop teacher. I was a big fan of MASH, the TV show MASH, as was Mr. Orlando. And I wanted to make um, the, the, the signpost, which is in the show, directing all the, the places where they lived. MASH was, you know, at that time, you know, almost a cult thing. Uh, you know, for, for anybody who watched it, it was everybody ran home and watched it, you know, but, but you took a certain interest in it. And so, 
you know, I'm looking at it, and I said, well, yeah, it's not a, you know, sure, he wants to do that, why not? Yeah. That's why I said, well, let, let's, let's work on it. I wanted to make a full size, but they told me I couldn't because it wouldn't fit on the school bus. <laughs> There was a special room in the school for emergency situations known as the crisis room. This, right, we're walking here, and I believe about here is where it stopped when I was here, and this was what they called the crisis room, which was a basic plain room, no windows, and there was a lot of emotionally disturbed uh, uh, kids, mostly boys, that were, that were in the school and um, they'd come in here kind of for a timeout or do their school work in here if they were disruptive and uh, disruptive in, in the class. As part of my visit, I was invited to speak at their annual Touchdown for Success event. I first want to say thank you all for coming out. And I cannot believe, I've been away for 25 years, how awesome this night is and how, um, how far the school has come with technology we didn't even have computers back then. When I came to Calais uh, over 25 years ago, uh, it was it was very it was not well known, almost non-existent, and um, we've come a long way in, in many years. And Calais was one of the only schools that was um, probably uh, knew enough about it to be able to treat the couple people with stress like human beings. And we're doing my documentary called My Life, My Story, My, uh, my Tourette's. And we were happy to be part here of, um, of uh, Touchdown for Success in being one of many parts of my life. And I want to thank you all very much for donors, staff, teachers, children. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. I had a wonderful experience visiting my old stomping grounds. But as I saw the progress being made and the developments that the school has undergone, I couldn't help but imagine how expensive it must be to attend. I realized how important public funding for education program is for kids who couldn't afford such a privileged place, and I wanted to find out more about it. As far as we know, there's only two states that receive funding from their local state government to support Tourette syndrome, mm -hmm. and that would be Pennsylvania mm -hmm. at about 150,000, mm -hmm. and New Jersey, the state of New Jersey, um, at one time was funding their organization for a million dollars a year. Wow. Um, I believe, though, it's been cut. Um, many things had to be cut there, but I think it's about a half a million dollars a year. Um, they do awareness, they do amazing, incredible things with that money. So in addition, to private donations. It turns out that state funds are also available for funding Tourette Syndrome organizations. But I was curious to see why only two states currently do. The reason could be that it's very difficult these days to, to actually get the attention of the legislature and then to actually, we are, um, Tourette Syndrome in Pennsylvania is actually a line item in the Department of Health's budget. I decided to reach out to my good friend and local state representative of Pennsylvania, Rosemary Brown, to get some more answers. I know the state, we have funded $150,000 in this year's budget, which I know doesn't seem like that much money, um, but between Tourette syndrome, autism, lupus, some of some of the larger, you know, um, cancer, you know, there are different things that the, that the um, state tries to fund to help promote education mm -hmm. and to promote to people to be able to diagnose, to be able to treat, to be able to get the resources they need to. As you were saying, you had one of the best doctors. Mm -hmm. So how do you, if you get diagnosed with Tourette's, if you know what Tourette's is, if you get diagnosed with it, where do you go from there and what are the resources? And I think that's part of where the $150,000 is supposed to be dedicated to. I think New Jersey probably provides uh, the best opportunity for special needs kids because um, I think the services and, and the, uh, you know, the monitoring by, by the state uh, provide, uh, you know, a good uh, opportunity for students to, to succeed. If somebody's watching this and their state does not have a Tourette yeah. syndrome appropriation in their state budget, the first thing oh. they need to do is contact their local state legislature. Okay. So whether it's your state representative or your senator from your state, uh, that is who you need to contact because they are the ones who do the state budget. They are the ones who would fight and advocate for uh, money to be spent towards Tourette's education and Tourette's resources to be available to those people who live in that state. There were years that it was 50000 wow. It just depends on the, the amount of the funding that the state wants to do. Um, 
with the increase up to 150,000, we were thrilled. However, the grant agreement comes with all kinds of stipulations of how many things we have to do. Tuition has to be approved every mm -hmm. year by the state. Right. They'll tell you if your if your tuition is uh, is going to go up and by how much. The more research and development and the more science you can have behind Tourette's, the better off you are. So you're fighting for that end, and then you're fighting for the end of continual education and continual support once you are diagnosed right. with it as well. So you know you've got both both spots. You're kind of yeah. you're both you're working on raising awareness and funds for Tourette's is a difficult and necessary struggle to face. I was inspired by Rosemary's efforts on the legislative end. And I wanted to make an effort on my end to gain support for our cause. As a start, I reached out to a nearby restaurant to host a fundraising effort. We're here at the Texas Roadhouse in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania um, at a fundraiser. We had a flyer that we had um, the restaurant do up. 10% of everybody's uh, bill will go to the Turek Syndrome Alliance in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So they are here today um, helping us sponsoring uh, this, uh, this event as well, which is wonderful. And we're selling um, dollar raffle tickets, um, which you can either win a $25 uh, voucher, a t-shirt, or a um, uh, caricature from Promodio Studios. And again, we're just having a good time. And uh, it's still early, so we're looking to get some more people in here, help, help the cause. So. In addition to the role that educators and school systems play in the development of a child with Tourette syndrome, perhaps even more important is the support of family in helping everyone deal with the disorder. I came from a family where we didn't, my parents didn't believe in medication, it was very holistic. None of my siblings were vaccinated. It took a long time for them to accept it, wow. but they didn't understand. Right, and different so, era, different time, yeah. Yeah, and because they didn't understand, um, it caused the distance. Mm -hmm. And they would say, well, you vaccinated them, you caused this, and it, it just hurt so much to feel, to be made to feel like I brought this on oh, my children. Wow. We're all one. Whatever else is true, we're interconnected. Whatever we can do together will be much stronger than anything that we can do on our own. It's easy to, to neglect or forget about your other children, um, especially if they're older and the child with Tourette's is younger. As this was all happening at home and the, the, the tantrums and the mood swings and everything, um, Jen really suffered. It was very traumatic for her. There were times when I was like, okay, just get out of the car and go to school for me so I can get the other two off oh. to where they need to be. Go take care of yourself. But we did therapy. I did take her on trips alone. I did okay. as much as I could. But there's no doubt that she did experience trauma growing up in a house. Um, with neurological differences sure. in the children. Okay. When we were little, yeah. one of the things, you know, that affected us as children was the inability to go out for dinner. Right. Uh, we used to go out for dinner every, every Friday night when Mommy and Daddy would take us out to dinner. And it would be, there would be times when your tics were disruptive to the point where we, Daddy would have to stay home with you yeah. because you just can't take this, like, barking kid to the diner, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I remember growing up and being very close with my father, and he was very understanding of my condition. But I came to learn that not everyone had the same experience. Daddy was very in introspective. Sure. He he was uh, he wasn't a shallow person. Uh, I'm sure he gave a lot of thought. You know, even though he didn't, Daddy hid his feelings. Daddy hit, would hide his feelings sure. very well. Sure. He was a good actor too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, he didn't show you his emotions very it's often. I mean, the only time. emotion you ever saw out of Daddy was. Very happy or very mad. <laughs> it's a product of his time. Yeah. As far as right, you right, didn't show emotion, right. but you didn't talk about things like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. He said, and he butted in, blurted in, he said, Kenny, uh, I didn't know there was anything wrong with you. Just like out of the blue, you know. And I knew what he was talking about. I said, oh, yeah. And I said, well, nobody did. I said, the doctors didn't know either. I wanted to kind of make an excuse for him, you know. Yeah. I remember Brad Cohen's father had some comments on the issue. 
Initially, I, I guess the biggest thing I could say is that it was a frustration. It's the frustration as a parent that you know that every parent wants to help solve the problem. Sure. As a father, my first response is, I want to fix this. My daughter had a problem, I'm going to fix it. And you can't Oh, it, there's fix. no control. There's no control. Exactly. So sure. the fathers are going, oh, they, they, I can't they, fix I it. I can't deal with I'll be off the game. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and so that, having been a father, that's an important job. Oh, shit. Oh, God, yeah. Right? But to take care of your family, exactly. especially something yeah, like yeah. that. Right. There, there are moments where being the dad and being the guy who fixes things doesn't really contribute. You have to, so the moms have a, a lot more of the tools in the toolbox than the dads. Oh, use. absolutely. The therapist said that the best predictor traditionally of of good outcome for these kids is a strong strong mom. Uh, and Steve, you know, really provided for us. And, and came came along with us, uh, and and he was involved. My mother was the rock. She pretty much was 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 everything as far as funding and information. I, I I can't even imagine, and I don't know how, what research or how she did things back, how they did things back then because we didn't have the computer. She couldn't get on the computer and look like you can now. Um, a lot of word of mouth, but I think we were very fortunate to have Dr. Shapiro as our doctor. After Brooke mentioned her therapist's input on the matter, I decided to meet with one myself and ask about strategies for families to deal with a disorder. This is Ryan, a licensed social worker who specializes in child development and parenting. I think that communication is an extreme, uh, extremely important. Um, if the parent doesn't ask the child how he's feeling or what's going on, then the parent can't really know. And he's being asked, how he what how he suggests um, yeah. he um, you know deal with his own issues not being told what to do this is what you're gonna do to stop it he needs to be asked and he needs to be invested in it so it's my belief that a parent should never use corporal punishment or um, other harsh methods uh, like screaming or belittling um, of a child I think it's especially um, pertinent Although with all children, it's especially pertinent with, with people with uh, children with Tourette's syndrome um, because Tourette's syndrome is exacerbated by fear and anxiety. I failed the seventh grade. Yeah, that was. And um, my daddy was still mad. He let me have it all the way home, talk, you know, some of the things he said. Uh, it, was, it, was a bad, it was a bad day. And um, I remember thinking, you know, I, my collie dog had died uh, a year before. Uh, you know, I was real close to him, and uh, I remember thinking, like, <clears throat> when I went to bed that night, praying that I could wake up in heaven with him. So a child should never be punished for something that they can't control. Um, what a parent needs to do is to try to understand how the child is feeling and to understand, um, you know, what's going on and, and the fact that they can't control it. We really focus on treating an individual from a, from a biopsychosocial perspective, which basically means incorporates your biology, your psychology, and your social aspects. So, for instance, with Tourette's syndrome, um, the Tourette's itself is part of your biology. Um, it's, it's known to be a neurological uh, condition, and so it's part of your physical aspect. Um, now, that's going to influence your psychological and your social in uh, various ways. So the negative uh, parts of that, of course, uh, socially you might be ostracized because you're a little different in some ways, um, you know, your verbal or physical tics. It's clear to me that Tourette syndrome is more than just a physical disorder. It affects the person emotionally and socially as well. And the person who is diagnosed is not the only person who has to struggle. We are here to support individuals affected by Tourette's syndrome, and that affected means in so many ways. It doesn't mean the person diagnosed. It means anyone that's affected. In a family um, with, a, with a child with Tourette's, a lot of times the emphasis is put on the child and the child's care, uh, which is appropriate. Um, a lot of time, you know, extra time and effort has to be spent. But I think that um, it's important that the entire family is taken care of so that the uh, parent also uh, takes care of the other children in the household, of course. And uh, more, more, uh, equally important is that the parents take care of themselves. 
I thought Ryan had made a good point. Sometimes in caring for others, we can lose sight of caring for ourselves, and that can lead to problems. Shortly after, I was invited by Patsa to attend one of their family retreats where kids and parents can learn more about their disorder and ways to deal with it together. So we are here for the weekend and super excited. Uh, we were involved with, uh, with the TSA with Sherry and uh, Sabrina and, uh, and, and, and the rest of the staff. Um, I'm speechless, this is wonderful. We are here with a bunch of, of parents and children of different ages, uh, young adults, teens, with Tourette's and having a wonderful time. This is something they do, I believe this is, next year is gonna be the 30th anniversary. Uh, I was told of the of the retreats. I had a great time at the retreat. It was a wonderful way for families with Tourette's to learn and get away from the stress of everyday life. A chance for kids with the disorder to meet others and to feel at home without the sometimes awkward glares of the public eye. The kids got to explore their creative side with craft projects and enjoy a sunny afternoon on a hayride, strolling by a lake, trying to catch some fish, and even developing courage through the challenge of a rock climbing wall. Around the time the retreat was happening, there was a social media challenge for ALS that went viral and did wonders to raise awareness and funds for that disorder. I was inspired by the progress that had been made in such a small amount of time, so I came up with a similar challenge for Tourette's, the pie in the face challenge. In the same respect as they're doing the ice water challenge for ALS, we're going to do a pie in the face for Tourette syndrome. The pie challenge caught on and everyone at the retreat was excited to be a part of it. After the retreat, a podiatrist with Tourette syndrome by the name of Dr. David Levesque had gotten wind of my tour and wanted to share his story as part of it. He is one of the few Tourettes who has coprolalia, and I was interested in knowing how he handles a medical practice with that condition. We give them a brochure, basically, and, uh, and the brochure is kind of a combination of uh, a get-to-know Dr. Levesque mm -hmm. kind of a thing. So it's a brochure that basically entails, um, you know, who I am, a little bit about what my background is, where I'm from, mm -hmm. and where I went to school, kind of a little bio, short bio. Um, but in that same brochure, there is also um, a few uh, frequently asked questions and some Q&As about, you know, Tourette's. I wondered if he had any hairy situations with patients in his office because of his Tourette's that it's not too often, but I, I certainly have had, you know, a, uh, a person or two that is, you know, not quite understood or didn't want to understand or didn't take the time to really yes. kind of ask the right questions um, and be understood. And, um, you know, and they walked out, you know, an experience that I had uh, in my practice a number of years back uh, where I was, you know, I was working on a, uh, a female patient. I was taking care of somebody and, um, and I uttered a few you know, obscenities, which I, I didn't really mean, and I, I think one of them was the was bitch word, and um, I think she took that personally, even though I know at that time we had done the same kind of education. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess it really got her upset and, and turned her off, and she just walked out in the middle okay. of, the, of the treatment. I was sorry to hear about Dr. Levesque's bad experience with the patient but it made me realize that my mission to provide understanding for Tourette syndrome was more important than ever. As it turns out, he and I shared a common bond in relation to our Tourette's, Dr. Shapiro. Yeah, so we were talking about Dr. Shapiro. Uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy yeah. that we've had the same, uh, the same doctor. <laughs> he started me on the, on the Hal doll, yeah. uh, probably at age nine, okay? okay. Um, and again, <laughs> You know, you and I were uh, were probably some guinea pigs in some ways because um, that medicine had to be prescribed extremely uh, slowly, kind of in low doses, and you had to be titrated up.
Uh, there were times when, um, uh, years later, where he had brought me up to as much as seven milligrams a day. It always puzzled me as to why people with coprolalia are forced to utter profanity as opposed to something else like a name or a fruit. I personally believe that um, that there is a uh, an area of the brain, I know you, you probably know, that most of the, the work that they're doing seems to be in the basal ganglia, right. um, which is the area in the limbic system that, that controls, you know, uh, a lot of the movement and stuff, but also areas uh, that deal with um, uh, unacceptable um, things to, mm -hmm. to say, you know, or do. To learn more and help solve this mystery, I decided to reach out to the Atlantic Neuroscience Institute located at Overlook Medical Center in Summit, New Jersey. I asked Dr. Curlin, lead neurologist and research director at the Institute, if he could explain a little bit more on the way Tourette syndrome affects the brain. Well, Tourette syndrome is considered a movement disorders in um, neurology. And movement disorders um, generally localize to problems in a deep part of the brain called the basal ganglia. And so the basal ganglia is very much involved in the control of movement. Um, the frontal lobe is kind of considered the brain's brake. That is, it stops things. It looks like in Tourette syndrome, the connection between the frontal lobe and the basal ganglia is particularly impaired. The thought is when the, the ability to apply the brake is damaged, um, there are behaviors, words, actions that come out. Um, and for some reason, and I don't think anybody understands it, many of them are kind of the worst possible thing somebody could say. In my travels, I came across the term, the triad of Tourette syndrome, which describes the spectrum of TS. So the term, the triad of Tourette syndrome, refers to the fact that there are three conditions that commonly coexist. Tourette syndrome uh, is the first, the second is obsessive compulsive disorder, and the third is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So you can ask why do they occur together? So the most likely explanation is that they are related to dysfunction of the same part of the brain. I asked Dr. Curlin what might happen if someone who has auditory issues also has Tourette syndrome. There is an interesting phenomenon that even in people who can't speak, um, deaf, uh, generally or mute individuals, um, they use their sign language to um, produce uh, obscene gestures. So that's called copropraxia. Um, copro means dirty, lalia means speech, praxia means movement. So a dirty movement, so giving the finger other things. Um, and so that is something that does occur in the, the deaf or mute community. I also mentioned to him that I started to notice a slight connection between Tourette syndrome and people of French descent, and what I call the French connection. It's generally accepted that Tourette syndrome can occur in pretty much any ethnic group. Um, it's not equally or evenly distributed, so there are some ethnic groups that are uh, less represented. Statistically, when you're in an um, ethnic family, especially if you're in a, like an urban area, those kids are not really getting looked at as a possible TS or, or you know, um, or anything else. They're more going to be, you know, categorized as ADD, ADHD, or a problem behaviors. There are very few epidemiologic studies that have actually purposely gone out to look at ethnic minority populations to try to see if the frequency of Tourette syndrome really is any lower than other populations. Um, and that is some work that we, we had proposed to do, but we're not funded, but I, I think it's something that's important to do. If you go into an urban area, you ask someone, pull someone off the street, you know, hey, you heard of Tourette's, they, what is that? Exactly. You know, but they could tell you about, you know, the ADD, ADHD, what medications go with what? Mm -hmm. But anything that's like a TS, something that is not as well known, in a lot of areas, it, you don't really see. It's generally thought that it's about a three to one ratio in terms of the tick disorder itself. Um, but if you bring in the other elements of the triad, um, especially if you include obsessive compulsive disorder, um, 
it, uh, that seems to be a little more common in females. So if you look at the triad, if you look at the whole picture, it gets closer to an equal distribution between genders. Um, but the ticks themselves and ADHD tend to be more of a male uh, expression, whereas the obsessive compulsive features tend to be more of a female expression. I wanted to know if there was any truth behind the theory that Tourette syndrome is passed on from a gene of the father's side, which often causes tremendous feelings of guilt. Um, males do tend to express the tics more than females, but it's not that they, as far as we know, it's not that males tend to pass on the genes more than females. And fathers have to do the research, have to listen to the experts and, and understand that this is not something that they're going to be able to fix. Um, especially through punishment, um, you know, through, um, through teaching. But they, the good news is they can lessen the symptoms, you know, by following positive parenting uh, practices um, and avoiding being harsh, which unfortunately is a lot of uh, father's first instinct. As I've said before, one of the ways I manage my tics is through focusing on creative projects. It was once again time for me to make an appearance at the living room. This time, the event was a space-themed fashion show. There were makeup artists doing full-body paint and costumes to be presented at the show. While all that was going on, I was upstairs applying my own costume for the show. The theme is uh, space and science fiction. Um, so people do artwork, and they're all also having a fashion show. Uh, you know, everybody has beautiful homemade costumes they've made. I made this, this hat, this is styrofoam, painted it like the Earth with an alien invasion uh, blasting into the earth and the planets, and then a, a, a protruding alien uh, reptilian face. When I'm, when I'm in my element, I'm, I'm focused in doing like the makeup and the costuming. Um, I don't, I don't tick almost nothing in, or very little, and um, just can't explain it. I don't even think anything of it. Of fun at the living room space fashion show but as I put on the reptilian makeup to cover up my face I couldn't help but think that there is an unfortunate tendency for some people with Tourette's to feel like they need to hide under a mask. Between being distorted by pop culture and its historical link to demon possession it is no wonder that people who suffer from Tourette's feel the need to hide. Kendall Smith at the end of his book, A Fragmented Life, even wrote a personal letter to his demon as a way to come to terms with his condition. I will now take advantage of my literary license to personally address the demon, whom was my adversary and lifelong tormentor. Writing this book was meant to be the culmination of my meager life work. It was God's appointed duty for me and the reason I was not spared the trials of preparation. I never gained wealth or fame, and I now see that it would have distracted me from my mission. I shall always remember the famous words of Helen Keller. I thank God for my handicaps, for through them I have found myself, my work, and my God. I realize now that eventually only death will entangle you permanently from my mind. The moment my heart ceases to beat, you will be extracted from my soul forever. In the interim, I can take comfort by knowing your power against me has weakened. No longer am I the frightened little child you can bully with nightmares, intrusive thoughts, and various compulsions. I can look you in the eye and see you are no more than a coward that turns people's minds against themselves. You'll never make me run, cry, or hide again because I will never fear you again. I have faith that this story will become my final and most devastating counterpunch against you. People hopefully will read this book and come to understand you and advocate for the helpless. And again, I say this in all sincerity, if only one child's life is rescued from your influence, my struggle was not in vain. And now, if I may be so bold to borrow a quote from St. Paul that said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race. Therefore, Mr. Demon, in the fight of our life, it appears you won every round, except the one that mattered the most, the last round. I win, you lose, and for us, this is the end.
Interestingly, uh, I had a patient whose brother uh, had bad Tourette syndrome. She had Tourette syndrome. And one of his tics was a howling kind of barking tic. And uh, he was actually considered by his community, um, which was the Adirondack area uh, in New York State, right. um, to be a werewolf or to have some sort of demonic possession. And um, my understanding, he was not treated very nicely by members of the community. You have to yeah. remember too, when talking about this topic, it's not just the ticks. I mean, there are rages, there are mood oh, issues, yeah. anger issues. Lots of so things. there's lots of things that go on in a home where mm -hmm. a lot of times the kids save it for but home and they save it for their moms or their parents. I did the same parents, thing because they, they feel comfortable. Around yeah, them. the person they feel the most comfortable with. You know, I, I think uh, the coprolalia, yes. um, the involuntary swearing, certainly could contribute to that sort of idea. Why would a young child be blurting out swear words mm -hmm. um, in, in people who you know, really didn't have good medical knowledge or scientific knowledge, you know, it might make sense that they're possessed by the devil and uh, uh. the devil's making them do that. An incident not, not all that long ago where uh, there was a well-meaning uh, a friend uh, who really did think it was somebody who came into the church and was uh. going to spend some time think, uh, being a, a youth leader. Uh, and he was invited to do an internship or something. And, uh, and he very much thought that um, perhaps there was, you know, some kind of a, uh, you know, possession going right. on or um, bondage or, you know, unseen. something fucking along those lines and you know, uh, unconfessed sin or something you did. Um, and I was gracious enough to, to listen. You know, that's hopefully long gone in, in terms of people's thinking, but yeah. it's definitely part of the history of Tourette syndrome. On occasion, as a hobby, I like to go ghost hunting with my two close friends, Lou and Angela. As part of my tour, I asked them to take a trip with me to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, to reminisce about some of our ghost hunting adventures. Gettysburg is one of the top five haunted places in the country um, because of the, of course, all the, the Civil War and um, which was unfortunate, but there are lots of energies and spirits here of the men who had died here. In one of our investigations, uh, Lou, myself, and a couple other people were in the, the basement part of this gentleman's house um, with the EVP, of course, the electronic voice phenomena recorder um, and our digital cameras. And after um, checking out the equipment, uh, amongst us talking and laughing in the basement, you can hear what sounds like a young boy maybe talking to a parent, a father. I was also upstairs with some folks and we got a recording of happy birthday. The, the whistling, yeah, yeah. Whistling. And, and some, right. That was really good. Some whistling and, uh, but that recording somehow, I don't know, got lost. I've been yeah. listening for it. I'll, I'll play what, what we caught down in the basement and I'm gonna play it from 10 seconds before and then I'll play a few seconds after. Uh. Okay. See if you guys remember hearing. Yeah, that's all right. That's our our signal. No, no, it was upside down. Like you scared. No, yeah, it was like that, right? Yeah, too, right? Hello to her. Yes, what's over here? Can I show this up? Can I cancel? All right, turn all the flashlights. Remember that? You hear it now? Yeah, I was right. Did you hear it? Play it again. You'll you'll hear it start to come through. It comes through like a like a radio as everyone's talking. Creepy. And then he goes, it's over there, can I show them? No, I don't think so. No, no, it was upside down, I'd be scared. No, oh, yeah. Yeah, it was like that, right? Yeah, too, right? Right there. Oh, I heard it. So it's going on as all of us are kind of... We don't know what's there. ...verbalizing something. Someone's laughing, someone's talking, someone's saying something. But it's definitely... The tone of the voice is definitely not yeah. any of the people no, that no, were there. No, 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 no. We were all, you know older than that voice sounding. Yeah. Ghost hunting for me is a fun way to explore and seek connection to the spirit side of life. Much like the letter that Kendall wrote, I suppose it's a way of confronting my own Tourette syndrome demons. So there has been a lot of work uh, in research to try to sort out what the neurochemical changes are in the brain that seem to underlie Tourette syndrome. And most of the focus oh. has ended up on a chemical called dopamine. 
and dopamine is very much involved in the control of movement. And so most of the medications we use uh, to treat tics involve changing the levels of dopamine or the, the uh, intensity of dopamine. More recently, there have been some research advances that are starting to shine a light on a different neurochemical called histamine. And uh, a lot of people know of histamine um, because of antihistamines, and those are medications that are used to treat allergies and uh, block histamine, generally in the periphery of the body, not in the brain. But I think a lot of people don't realize that histamine is also considered a neurotransmitter in the brain, so it's one of those chemicals that helps brain cells communicate with each other. And it is active in the basal ganglia and the frontal lobe regions um, that we think are the sites of problems in Tourette syndrome. Dr. Curlin talked to me about the latest clinical trials he was conducting to identify any possible links between histamine and Tourette's. One of the companies, AstraZeneca, um, uh, met with me and we discussed the development of one of their products which blocks a certain um, histamine receptor called the number three, H3 receptor. And that we thought it made sense to test the medication in children with Tourette syndrome because of this emerging information. This is Nicholas, one of the participants in Dr. Curlin's clinical trial. Like myself, he is helping to pave the way for new breakthroughs in Tourette syndrome treatments. My mom just, I think she just saw it on the internet actually. I think we got, we actually might have gotten an email from uh, the um, NJTSA. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, she called and set up a first appointment and took it from there. Yeah. The drug is experimental, but it's already been tested in humans. It's been shown to be safe. It was tested for other conditions. Oh. Um, and so we worked together to uh, put a research project together that involves several centers. Um, and we've been testing the medication in uh, adolescents with Tourette syndrome. And so it's, it's the first time this type of medication has ever been tested in Tourette syndrome. I wanted to, because it helped me a lot. So, you know, I figure I do the study, it'll get out faster, sure. the medicine. I was glad to see that there was a new generation of kids who are willing to take the reins and continue to search for answers to the mystery of Tourette syndrome. Without you having taken those steps and mommy having allowed him to test on you, we wouldn't be where we are now. Unfortunately, there's often a lot of red tape and even a lack of funding for research in developing new treatments for Tourette's. The Orphan Drug Bill Act was for drugs that just, that people had developed, scientists had developed these drugs and they thought they'd be a big help, but they had no money backers. It's a way for pharmaceutical companies to show an interest in some of these medications that will be helpful for smaller populations of people. So I know that Tourette syndrome um, does fit into that category and there are probably 50,000 different <laughs> yeah. situations and, uh, 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 and diagnoses that could fit into that. But I think what you find in pharmaceuticals is that you know, there are a lot of drugs that are approved for certain conditions and um, they're approved for that use. And as a person who, who would sell some of those drugs, you would sell that to the doctor as this is what it is used for. But then there's other uses which we call off-label uses. And I think that that brings a whole different aspect into the products that we have available for treatment of any conditions. A pharmaceutical company, you know, they're in for it to make money, right? They want to they wanna make money and so they might want to treat something like heart disease or diabetes that is, you know, going to be something that everyone needs. Um, but when it's less than 200,000 people, there's going to be very fewer people who need the drug and so research gets delayed. So that's why the Orphan Drug Act was, was done. On my tour, I had heard about another Toretter who had his own way of spreading awareness, so I invited him to the living room to spread the word. He goes by the stage name of Chaos. I'm a 27-year-old Tourette syndrome sufferer as well. Just like Danny, man, I find inspiration to inspire other people with what God gave me, with what God blessed me with, because I used to be ashamed of it, but now, you know, I embrace this, because with this, I get to tell the world it's not about how you're born. It's about what you do, what you're born with. It's about how you inspire. Chaos used his talent 
to write a song about his struggle with Tourette syndrome to inspire others. This song is called Still Alive, and it details everything that happened back then. I hope you guys love it. You ever been told you're worthless? Or that you're a nobody? Or that you're too ugly? Or that you're whatever? Look those same people in the face and tell them your words ain't gonna kill me. I'm still alive, baby. Listen to the words of this. Yo. I've been knocked down, face to the ground before. Suicidal thoughts, I didn't want to live anymore. Took my prescription pills and popped them as I cried. Hoped it will be painless and I instantly died. I gave up on life, I felt I had no fight left. I was taking the right steps but felt so lifeless. My dad wasn't there like I was none of his business. Tourette syndrome diagnosed, screaming, twitching. Was made fun of, you shaking and screaming words. Was drinking at a young age, trying to straighten out the curves. All I wanted at that moment was to stop breathing. Going through this prep wasn't gonna be easy. But for some strange reason, I didn't die. Ever since I regretted attempting suicide, I realized when I thought that I couldn't survive, I was only fooling myself. I'm still alive. Yeah. I'm still alive. I was certainly inspired by Chaos and his song, and I wanted to use my talents to take the pie in the face challenge to the next level. The result was a short film of my favorite characters taking the pie in the face challenge to raise money for the cause and each of them had some information about the disorder to share. I set up a green screen in my garage and I started to get into character. I even had a buddy of mine and his assistant come to apply full zombie makeup for one of the characters of the film. And here is what we did. Hi, my name is Danny Ferrin. I'm from the documentary, My Life, My Story, My Tourette's. We're here today at Pie Fest, a new convention where people get pied in the face to help raise awareness for Tourette's. Celebrities are here today to help raise awareness for Tourette's, like the Three Stooges. Right, Danny, and contrary to what you might think, we're not here today for the pies. Hey, what gives? Hey, Larry! You forgot to tell him how one out of every 100 people might have Tourette Syndrome. You knucklehead! Uh, uh, uh. I was gonna, you ninny. You know, throwing pies reinforces stooge stereotypes. Ah, oh, you couple of knuckleheads. Ow! Ow! That hurt How'd you, you do that for? Head? No one could have seen that coming. Right, Groucho? Right, sweetheart. As a matter of fact, I'll learn you another thing. Did you know that Tourette's is not just cursing? or body movements or uncontrollable twitches. It's also facial gestures as well. Mr. Marx, I'm gonna make you an offer you can't refuse. If it's something with horse heads, I think I'm comfortable refusing. No, it's uh, some free pies. Ooh, let me have it. There's no way this can go wrong, right? See, the thing about the mafia, ladies and germs, is there are only about two things, horse heads, and pies. Ooh. Well, our next guest is the cat in the hat. Tourette's can occur in childhood. You should be aware of this. You should. If you see a child cursing, it might be their fault or something worse. Act, I'm attacked! I must pie back! And I need a saucer of milk and somebody get that. So I'll tell you, there was this guy the other day on the street. He was ticking so bad, the kid asked him, hey, are you Big Ben? I'll tell you, people with Tourette's, they get no respect, you know what I'm saying? What does a guy got to do around here to get some awareness? <laughs> now, that's what I call lactose intolerant.
Things are getting ugly, folks. I don't think it's gonna look too good for Pie Fest next year. But anyway, thanks for coming. Now it's your turn to take the pie in the face challenge. To help raise awareness for Tourette syndrome. I always understood the influence that the entertainment industry has over the public's perception. I also recognize the tremendous power of education that exists in entertainment. I'm hoping that this that, that this documentary and my story uh, will touch millions of people. We're using the using the media in, in in this same respect to to get my story out about my life and the the lives of the many people we've met who have Tourette's. Tourette's has always. Um, Kind of, kind of. I don't want to say a joke, but I mean, for some people, they they make they they make light of it a lot, and that's just that's society not being that bright sometimes. Recently, there has been a film released called *The Road Within*, which follows the journey of three young people, one of whom has TS. It is a wonderfully written and fun film about the situations that people with the disorder might endure. It is the first I have seen that does not distort the reality of the condition. Although I had a great time making the Pie Challenge short film, I knew that I wanted to have a bigger impact on educating the public. I would need to become more of an ambassador myself. I reached out to those I knew I could count on from Patso, and together we formed a local support group where I could meet with real people and help them deal with their situations. I believe that it is the responsibility of every Toretto to help spread awareness and promote understanding of this disorder. The mom, she educated the entire family, um, creating all, like, you know, five advocates for Tourette's. So everywhere we went, we educated too. If you have Tourette's or you have uh, OCD or ADHD or anything that, that makes you different, it's your job on this earth to educate people. You are, your, you are your own best resource. We all want to be treated equally and treat them as a human being and a, as a friend instead of thinking that there's something horribly wrong with that person and shying away. Life would be easier. Life would be better, happier, and um, maybe that's the cure. Maybe that's the cure. I was even invited by the TSA of Delaware to attend their very first state walk. The Delaware TSA is a chapter that's been here over 15 years, wow. but this is our first awareness walk. Okay. So um, we're trying to raise awareness about Tourette syndrome here in Delaware. Um, we just had a resolution passed by our House and Senate in Delaware that makes May 15th to June 15th the official month of Tourette syndrome awareness. Joining me for the walk was my good friend, Dr. Lebeck and his wife. pleased to see that our efforts were beginning to make ground. Around the same time, I was told that Governor Christie of New Jersey was making a similar resolution, declaring June 4th as Tourette Syndrome Awareness Day. Of course, I had to be there, and I got to meet one of the most recent faces to hit the Tourette Syndrome spotlight, Tim Howard, who is the famed goalkeeper for the U.S. men's national soccer team. As I was nearing the end of my tour, I knew that my journey had only just begun. Unfortunately, I heard that recently Governor Wolf of Pennsylvania has removed PATSA from the state budget. This proves that though we have gained much ground, there is a constant struggle for those affected by this disorder to retain the support of the public. Getting the word out, going to your congressman, going to um, uh, uh, your local, local, um, uh, representatives and talk to them or, or make appointment with, appointments with them and say, 
I'd like to be involved. I want to get involved in helping um, this 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 foundation. One of the things I want to know is I see that the future of um, education in Tourette's has come so far. What else can we do? Like, wh where else can we go with this? Can we educate teachers? Can a little bit more? Um, can can there be more education of the general public? Not everybody's always an expert on how government works and the resources, and that's okay. You know, I think that we're trying to get people to become more educated on what your state representative does, what your local township official does, what your school board does, but um, it's important to know that your state legislator is very much supposed to be the closest state elected official to the people, and they are supposed to try to understand as many issues as they can about what's happening. And let's face it, publicity is publicity. Yes. Okay, even negative publicity is publicity. Yeah. And it works. Oh, yeah. It just gets people talking, it gets the discussion going, and that's really what we need. It has been an incredible journey. I have attempted to remove the masks and shed light on the truth regarding a disorder that has been a defining characteristic of my life. I have used my God-given abilities to spread awareness and promote understanding for those that will follow in my footsteps. I have been a sufferer, a guinea pig, a student, a dreamer, an artist, an actor, an educator, a therapist, and an advocate. My disorder has brought me full circle, and that which once consumed me has now set me free. Nothing else could ever be